This is Gitman's episode 41, where we visit the 2017 Git Merge Conference in Brussels, Belgium. Git Minutes is a show for proficient Git users, featuring stories, discussions, ideas, and other things useful for those using Git today. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show and how to support it on gitminutes.com. This episode is recorded on the 3rd of February, 2017, and the show notes are available on links.gitminutes.com slash 41. Git Minutes is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. You can get $10 of credit by entering the promo code GITMINUTES10 after you register your account. As you may or may not know, during the Git Merge conference, uh, which is sort of a user-oriented happening, there is a less-known event taking place called the Git Contributor Summit, where many of the contributors to Git itself get together to talk uh, core development face-to-face. This is, of course, a gold mine for Git Minutes interviews, and this is the third Git merge I've, I've gone to with my wife's trusty SingStar microphones. This time I got a total of eight interviews, and it's all top-notch quality talk with core contributors and people with some really hefty ideas on how to bring Git forward in the years to come. Again, Git merge was a place to talk about scaling Git, but uh, we also discussed how to get more diverse contributions into Git itself and how to advance the current world state of discussions and reviews around commits. And you'll hear more about that in the coming episodes. For the first uh, out of a total of two interviews in this episode, I grabbed Stefan Bello from Google. He is a seasoned Git merge participant and a core contributor. Uh, you may remember that I interviewed him uh, two years ago at another Git merge. At the Contributor Summit this year, he brought up one of the most hated and perhaps also loved parts of Git itself, submodules. After that, I'm talking to Jay Wyman from Microsoft about uh, how they're now actually using the full Git core from within Visual Studio, among many interesting things he has to report from Redmond. So let's start with Stefan. Okay, first interview (laughs) in a long time. Uh, from the podcast, I'm sitting now with Stefan Bello, and uh, yeah, yesterday this is like the second day of the conference. Yesterday, when everybody else were at doing workshops, we were at the contributor summit where we spoke about a lot of things, and uh, yeah, you had a you brought up an, a popular topic, uh, yeah, which is um, good submodules, uh, and uh, submodules, as uh, many people currently put it, are like. Uh, one of the nasty words in Git, yeah, because of the UX and the UI, which is sometimes confusing, and uh, that's what we want to change as well. Yeah, so uh, I, I haven't worked so much with submodules uh, personally, not because I try to avoid them. I always thought that they were a good tool for their job, uh, like what I saw about them. And uh, I mean, there's been a lot of work done on uh, submodules. Uh, throughout the ages, and uh, and they are used by many companies. Uh, where where is like the pain points? Why 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 do people dislike them so much? You think? I mean, concretely, uh, you said the UI. Uh, what, so how, when it, does it get confusing? Essentially, a submodule is a repository inside a repository. So um, one of the confusing things is where do you configure uh, the submodule, the repo- the repository that is sitting inside? Because uh, first, you don't have it yet, so you have to uh, say configure the URL on the outside, yeah. and then ask for the inner repository to be populated to be there, and then you have two places where there is configuration, yeah. for example, and that's one point of confusion, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, but when you operate with Git commands, like you clone repositories and you check out stuff, doesn't submodules get like taken care of now? Well. Um, in clone and fetch, you can ask to recurse into the submodules and it's going to be set up for you just as uh, you want. But mm. uh, So, for example, I'm currently working on checkout being uh, supportive of submodules. Uh, for now, checkout totally ignores submodules. So really? you really have to use the um, submodule command to ask uh, for an update inside the submodules. Ah, okay. So if I have like a repository where I, I, I branch out and I have five submodules in there, I also want to branch out like at the same time. Uh, I have um, to kind of do a submodule branch so in that, each of them. Oh, that, that's another uh, 
point that confuses users because submodules by design are always in detached head state and uh, detached head sounds scary at first uh, because <laughs> most users are actually used to work on a branch. Yeah. So um, we're reconsidering if we want to uh, have submodules actually on a branch and, and then you can just work on them. Just Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like, I mean, I used uh, Git Slave in the past uh, for, for doing that sort of stuff. And, and Git Slave is sort of ignorant of what is the state of the submodules. It just cares about branches and tags, basically. And yeah, I've, I've seen Git Slave. Uh, so, in, in my opinion, it's like a for loop and uh, operates on a couple yeah. of repositories exactly. doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I mean, there is a couple of more tools, like the repo tool or... Uh, yeah, there, there are other tools that fit into this uh, niche to um, yeah. work on many repositories. But all these tools get one thing wrong, is you have the five repositories, but you can't tell which state in one repository uh, is when, when for a given other state in, in, in the other repository, as in there is no relation between them. So there's you, no like concrete commit you can yeah, point you, uh, to, to the sub-repository, uh, well, uh, except if you use sub-modules, then you kind of get full control over what is exactly the state of yeah, the in, in entire in repository and sub-repositories. In, in sub-modules, you uh, record uh, the state of the sub-module just like you record the state of a file, so mm -hmm. you can exactly tell uh, by the parent project, SHA-1, the whole state of the world. And, and submodules have the advantage that they are part of Git and not something extra everybody has to install and configure. Uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, one of the advantages. Yeah. Uh, and so what is the plan going forward? Well, we, we are working on the UX uh, and, and, and the design to uh, get it in shape. So you're going to fix up the checkout command so submodules will be taken care of on the fly when you're uh, switching branches and doing well, stuff like that? Well, um, as always uh, in, in the development of Git, we first introduce it as a feature, so you have to explicitly say uh, that you uh, want to use this feature, and then sometime later, someone else or yourself as a developer comes up and asks, hey, we should make this a default because uh, yeah. everyone's using it and <laughs> liking it. And uh, yeah, so we want to keep the uh, surprises low for the users. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to let you go back to the, the next talk uh, you wanted to see. So, uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, so now I'm sitting here with uh, Jay Wyman from Microsoft. Uh, Thanks, Thomas. Um, so, what do you think about uh, Git Merge so it's, far? It's been fun. This is my second Git Merge, and um, it's, I think it's bigger every year. Yeah. And uh, actually, the presentations are getting a little more interesting, I think. Previously, yeah. it's always been about what's wrong with Git, and now it's a little bit more about what we're doing to make things better. There's still the what's wrong with Git ones, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, yesterday at the uh, contributor summit, you wanna what was what was your fondest memory, or what do you think are the most important things that we uh, like discussed yesterday that we have to to work with? I was really impressed with the number of groups: Google, Microsoft, GitLab, GitHub, obviously, that are actually doing making forward progress on Git and doing like impressive things to improve like server side performance, client performance, thinking about just how to make Git scale go faster, have a little bit better experience, that kind of thing. Mm. It seems like we're all moving together in this very similar direction, which is kind of like, gives me a lot of hope to see that uh, yeah. Git will keep picking up speed and, and keep becoming more useful. Can you talk a bit about uh, what you, uh, what's your role at Microsoft and how you're using, uh, or how you're involved with Git or using Git in that? Sure. So I work on um, the version control team in Microsoft's developer division. Okay. And uh, specifically, I work on Git, Git for Windows, and uh, Visual Studio's integration for Git. And my focus is primarily integrating right now, currently, with Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio 2017. We're switching from libgit2 to, to Git for Windows, direct shell out. Really? There's, there's a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons it's primary, um, and this is no knock on libgit2 at all. It's a fantastic uh, set of guys and piece of software. But Visual Studio for Legacy reasons is a 32-bit application. 32 bits, you get a limited amount of memory you can consume. And we're sharing that memory with the graphics of the IDE, the debugger, the other compilers in the system, stuff like that. And um, you bring in large repositories that have, like, say, 100 megabyte index. You're bringing up 100 megabytes of RAM just for fun for certain operations. Yeah. And 
in our case, getting out of process was important. So we were kind of given an option. We could decide to build our own executable around libgit2 and emulate git and go to that, or just use git. Mm-hmm. And um, so we've gone ahead and we built a wrapping layer around git for managing git processes and that kind of thing on Windows. And uh, that, all that source code for that portion of uh, Visual Studio will become open source in about a week or two from this point. Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, back then there, there was like a lot of motivation or reasons for using uh, libgit2 uh, from within or any application that uh, is using yes. git. Um, so what, how are you going to like deal with the problems of using git exe uh, directly? Uh, like, well, what are the issues that that kind of come up again when you want to switch back to the original, so to say? Sure. So w- when you're doing something like uh, libgit2, it's a library, right? And in our case, it's a dynamically loaded library. But you want to ask it a question, your measurements are in sub-milliseconds. If you ask it exe a question on Windows, and particularly Windows, you have a, a decent latency for process startup, and then you've got to have Git do its job. It's going to spew things back. Oftentimes, Git is more chunky than libgit2. Libgit2, it's easy to get one little tiny piece of information about a branch or something, whereas Git's going to give you all the branches and that stuff. So changing our internal usage of it, how our application takes the data off of the system and try to be more chunky, bigger operations so we have more responsive and caching. So do you, are you using both in, in a kind of hybrid? Uh, no, we've or got rid of libgit2 completely from the system. Okay. Uh, are, are you still uh, using libgit in any other parts of Microsoft? Or oh, sure. Um, there are groups um, inside Microsoft that provide services for Visual Studio or other uh, solutions within Microsoft that use libgit2 because it makes sense for them, um, mostly because they're not constrained by the, the 32-bit process space uh, limitations. Mm. One of the big problems Microsoft has um, that we've talked about today at Git Merge is that we're onboarding the Windows team into Git. And Windows is a very large code base. An example, it's got something like a 400 megabyte index. And so we're talking a massive amount of information being loaded into RAM all the time to even just start looking at the data. Yeah. Um, and for those teams like on the server who are managing things, they don't have to worry about an index and libgit2 for merging and stuff. It's brilliant. It works great uh, for um, code scanning who want to look at the contents of blobs and, and, and you know searching. It's good for them to use something like libgit2. Mm. But on the client side, Git worked out better for us because, like I said, we got out of process. The other benefit of Git is it's had a lot of traction recently, and there's been a lot more contributions flowing into it from GitHub, GitLab, Microsoft. You know, uh, Google's even putting things in now with attributes and stuff. And those contributions are going in much faster than they are with libgit2. Libgit2 is kind of in a state of perpetual catch-up at the moment. And for us, it was just easier to jump ahead to Git and get all the features right away. Okay. And then if we decide for some reason we can go back to libgit2, we'd, we'd help you know, bring sure. it up to speed. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I mean, may, maybe they will solve this kind of a memory problem uh, at some point. And, it, uh, or that. I, I have no clue about <laughs> Visual <laughs> Studio, the like core IDE's team, uh, opinion of 64-bit versus 32-bit. I don't actually have any information as why it stays 32-bit, but it okay. is for the time being. Okay. Um, has there been uh, what are like the big changes that it, there's been in, in Git? Uh, are you using Git for Windows? Uh, yeah, we use Git for Windows because uh, Visual Studio is tied to Windows, obviously. Yeah, so that's that's the correct title of the <laughs> yeah. that, that software piece. Uh, and I, I imagine there's been like a lot of improvements in, in there as well on there Windows. There have been. Can, so, can, can you say some of the improvements that sure, happened so, last year? So with us coming in and heavily using it, especially for Visual Studio, which is uh, user experience, and users don't want high latency in their clicks or waiting for branches to appear. Mm. We've done a lot of optimization around you know things like reading files from disk how to fetch them faster how to read the references faster how to you know try to get garbage collection in the background without stalling out the process you know all these little things like that in addition to that we've actually just done pure code optimizations in git oh. where there are there are types of optimizations that are really good if you look at them at scale and you wouldn't even think about them on a small repository. Yeah, exactly. And you're looking at like you know a work tree that's like two gigabytes in size. This you're, you're going to save a, a millisecond. When you're looking at the work tree that's you know 270 gigabytes on size. We're saving you know 18 seconds of you know status time or something like that. Like of, of the potential um, features or uh, improvements that we discussed yesterday, which ones is like most personally interesting for you? So I've been pushing for a long time to figure out some way of doing what I call a narrow clone. This is effectively a way to clone down um, uh, commits and trees. So I have a full rich history and leave the blobs somewhere else and grab them later, kind of like a shallow clone. Yeah. And so I might only grab the, the blobs at, at my checkout commit and then the entire history of the repository. So I can do a log type of operation. Sure. And so we're actually looking at trying to implement that and get, we've been talking to people from um, uh, PEF, primarily from GitHub and, and, and trying to architect what that would look like and how 
it would interact with things like shell or other operations and get yeah uh, you just have to send the patches <laughs> yeah well we've got some um they're not perfect we've got work to do but we're getting there okay uh can you say something about what it looks like the internal team that are working on git uh, so working itself? on git primarily um is johannes yeah. uh, the maintainer for git for windows who is now a microsoft employee he's finally being paid for his dedicated work to the community <laughs> which is fantastic um Jeff Hostetler, who's a coworker of mine, who's the primary dev on Git for Windows, while we're doing the 2017 bring up, because, because I guess I drew, I, I drew the short straw. I'm stuck working on the product that makes money, <laughs> where Jeff is allowed to go off and, and do interesting things with Git, which he's done most of the optimizations that we've seen come in. Oh. Um, things like switching to open SSL for uh, SHA-1 comp computations and stuff. Mm. Um, and then he's also doing a lot of the work with the, uh, the narrow trees or looking at how to do those things and seeing how to bring it in. Once 2017 lands, I'm hoping to get some time to come back and, you know, paid time to go back and actually help finish up the project and, and bring it up to the mailing list. And, and we, uh, we've had a side conversation. I didn't, but uh, one of the guys on the team did with Junio, uh, a maintainer from, from Google to forget. And uh, he seems interested in the project. So there's hope that we can get this through and it will help big repositories that people still have, you know, rich histories. Excellent. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything else that I should ask you about that I didn't yet or anything you want to share or? Uh, uh, um, no, I, I, things are going um, fairly well as from the Microsoft side, adoption of Git is, is going quickly. Um, the mentality of Microsoft, I've only been at Microsoft four years now. When I started, you know, there's all these talks about how there's be this new Microsoft, this one Microsoft open to open source and stuff, but it really wasn't happening. And now um, I'm seeing it really happen. It's kind of yeah. exciting. I joined Microsoft. I thought, well, they're a big company. You know, it, it's, I've got children now. I need to go solution. I've got some security. <laughs> um, it's time to get out of the startup scene. And but at the same time, I was like, well, they're going to try and do this open source thing. I have some experience. Let's, let's see if I can help them with that. And honestly, I think the company just picked up the new CTO, uh, Satya, the CEO. Yeah has done a great job of encouraging people to do these things and providing guidelines for doing it safely so people aren't panicking all the time. Like, oh my gosh, we're going to have GPL Windows or something like that. But still being able to, like, example, we have Canonical right in Windows now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, who would have thought of that five years ago? Seriously, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> you just go to the command line type fashion. Oh, it's Canonical prompt. This is actually Linux. Holy cow. And so, I mean, it, it's changing. It's exciting to see the things that are coming out. A lot of the people who have been kind of in the shadows with these really good ideas but not willing to go up against the infrastructure are kind of coming out. We're getting a lot of good traction. It's neat to see things come out this way. That's awesome. Yeah, it's exciting. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking with me, Jay. Yeah, thank you. And that was the end of this episode. While you wait for the next one, you can uh, subscribe to Git Rev News. We're in the process of uh, getting a much nicer domain uh, for that, so you're better off searching for it than me saying out the old URL here. Git Rev News is a steady monthly newsletter about the development of Git itself, plus, plus uh, mentions of all relevant things we catch going on in the source control tooling world. Once again, you can find the show notes for this episode on links.gitminist.com slash 41. And there you can also support the show via Flatter or Gratipay. Big thanks to everyone supporting the shows, including our sponsors, DigitalOcean. Sign up using the promo code gitminist10 for $10 of credit and you'll be supporting this show. You can post feedback or comments directly under the show notes or send me an email on feedback at gitminutes.com. You can follow the show on Twitter or Google Plus where you'll be notified of any new episodes or head over to gitminutes.com to see all the ways you can subscribe there. Until next time, thank you for listening.